Hello, everyone. Good evening. I'm Saisha Grayson, curator of time-based media at the Smithsonian American Art Museum in DC. I'm so glad you could tune in for this, the second of three live screenings and conversations we're hosting for the 2022 Women Filmmakers Festival at SAM, Remaking Space. Tonight's featured artist filmmaker is Beatriz Santiago Munez, and we'll be joined in our conversation after the films by Taina Caragol, the curator of painting and sculpture and of Latino art and history at the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery. In addition to tonight's special guests, I wanna sincerely thank the expansive team at SAM that makes this series possible and the American Women's History Initiative for supporting the festival in this, its fourth year and the folks at Smithsonian AV for bringing the Zoom to your screen and to our live captioner for making our conversation accessible to all. As we gather tonight in cyberspace, physically scattered in different locations, please join me in acknowledging the native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we each sit, including the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their home in DC, where Sam's historic buildings reside, and where I am in Lenape Hoking, also known as New York City. For more on the Lenape, also known as the Delaware Tribe, visit their official tribal website linked in the chat. And to learn more about the native peoples where you are, you can begin by cross-referencing the digital map Native Lands and the National Congress of American Indians list of tribal representation, also provided in the chat. And now, as we settle in for this program, I'd like to invite us all to take a deep breath to find a slower pace within our body and to let the tick tick of tasks and to do's drop off for now. And I'd like to suggest you put away other screens and get comfortable in your space and draw your attention to this virtual intersection where you, me, and the work of Beatrice Santiago Munez can meet. Because her work is often about slowing down and finding other paces and drawing attention. Um, when I was thinking about this year's Women Filmmakers Festival and a desire to kind of think about space as a way that filmmakers um, can get us to look at and attend to it differently, um, there is nobody who more aptly fit that theme or who consistently makes this question a center of their practice than Santiago Munas. Um, for me, over the past few years, there's been this real underscoring of how profoundly where we are impacts how we experience the world, um, and then also an urgency sort of related to how the environment is becoming a, an obviously existential consideration and, and how we relate to that is one that we really need to attend to. So I knew that this would be the focus for this year's festival and that Santiago Munez had to feature prominently. I first met Beatrice when curating a 2016 show on agitprop, which we defined as art, not just about political causes, but art that sought to make change in the world through its form and how it's distributed and how it reaches people. And at that time, her reputation reached from Puerto Rico where she lives and works to Brooklyn where I was for her anti-colonial feminist film practice, as well as her role in creative activism and pedagogy. And in preparation for that show, we discussed her work as a co-founder of Beta Local, an art platform and educational experimental program in San Juan, and her work organizing and leading these iterant or walking seminars with filmmakers and theorists and curators moving as a group around Puerto Rico in different landscapes to kind of learn from those spaces. But in typical fashion, as we were talking, she sort of radically shifted my whole way of approaching what could be considered agitprop, suggesting that we look at her film, La Cabeza Mato a Todos, which was both an artwork, but she said also a spell, a formal and ritual instantiation of poetic irrationality created expressly to confront and dismantle the irrationalities of the military industrial complex and the endless war machine. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about that. I've been thinking how deeply we've needed this spell for the all the years since that conversation. War has been a constant for regions across this planet ever since. And even as we focus on it today, as it ripples in horror through Ukraine and, and the Europe. And the militarism and the imperial project of the US has also been a constant, shaping Puerto Rico's landscape and people's experiences for centuries um, 
uh, through very much to the present. And so this history and current realities will be one we'll really be able to delve deeply into after the screening, thanks to Beatrice and Taina's um, real expertise um, in different ways of thinking and approaching this. However, in watching and talking through the works we'll see next, uh, I thought that it was interesting because the inverse might equally be true, that colonialism and militarism are themselves spells, a kind of form of mind control that instills in all of us the message that this way of organizing and ordering and seeing and destroying the world is perfectly rational and obviously inevitable. And maybe it's filmmakers and artists like Beatrice that are the spell breakers snapping us out of this seemingly sensical mirage and disorganizing our viewing and thinking. So other possibilities, other ways of thinking and being can emerge. So with those thoughts in mind, I'm really excited for us to watch together two works that do just that. First, Otros Usos or Other Uses from 2014, which is shot on the decks of Sieba where fishermen repurposed decommissioned military infrastructure for sustenance, and where you can see these lush views of Vieques, which hardly hint at the island's violent and toxic legacies after decades as a US military base and weapons testing site. That short film will be followed by Gosilla, a 2018 film made not about Hurricane Maria, but amidst the aftermath, showing what life was like after this kind of global warming supercharged storm reshaped the land and pathways through it, but also revealing really what comes before that, histories of disinvestment and disinterest that are implicit in the failing infrastructure and slow or absent institutional responses. So we'll have lots to chew on from those, but the final housekeeping before we play those, um, as noted in the chat, we have live captioning. So you can access that along the bottom of the picture during the Zoom um, and during YouTube. <laughs> but in the live Zoom, you can also submit questions using the Q&A box. So feel free to put those in as you think of them. You don't need to wait to the end, but we will turn to those later in the discussion. And because we are screening through Zoom, sometimes connectivity can impact resolution or playback speeds. If you notice any distortion or lags, just assume that's the platform and, and not the piece. So with that, um, we'll start the screening and then I'll have my guests come and join us for conversation. Thanks. Thanks, let's take a, another moment. Um, Taina and Beatrice, if you wanna join me on um, screen, turning on your cameras. Um, Thank you, Beatrice, again, for sharing those films with us and letting us share them with our audiences and for joining us um, on YouTube, Taina. Um, I, I feel like every time I, I see your work, it actually makes me wanna take a pause before I even speak. There's sort of, that's one of my invitations for that breath is really inspired by your work, this sense that there's a, a moment necessary to just sort of let a different kind of time sensibility come in and be part of the body. Um, and that's so different than, than the way we're used to kind of film and media working on us. You know, the expectation when you open your screen or you turn on the TV is that something's going to kind of bombard you. <laughs> and, um, and so that's something I, I hope we can get into as a strategy. And, and it's related to kind of the first question I wanted to put out there, which is, you know, in previous interviews, you've talked about there being kind of three visual or filmic stereotypes or works that film does in and around visualizing Puerto Rico um, and that you can sort of typologize those. There's economically motivated kind of tourist views, there's military and disaster propaganda, and then there's this kind of ethnographically oriented othering gaze. And here you have this practice that kind of slices through all of those and does something so drastically different. I almost want to go back to the moment when you realized like that, that there could be another way, you know, when did you kind of zoom in on film as the space you wanted to make that intervention? And then how did you think about like what, what a practice would be or an approach that would be that could shift mm -hmm. that and, and work differently in the spaces that matter to you? Yeah. Um, well, first, thanks for the invitation and the really generous introduction um, to the work and your reading of it. Um, I think that rather than um, realize that there was a different way uh, or somehow being able to see it, it was more of a, you know, going through first um, 
a, a, a kind of recognition of the way that those visual languages were ordering me and my own ability to see things. So I think that, um, and then and then the necessity to respond to that, not just with um, a critique, like this is the way that surveillance imagery works, or this is the way that um, kind of reconnaissance of a territory works, or this is, um, you know, it comes from the tradition of landscape, you know, and describing a property, but rather like, okay, so that must be just one way of looking. I, that's the one that I am organized by, as most of us are, um, and it must be um, sort of standing in the way of being able to, to see and imagine other things. And so, um, and then I, I use a lot of processes that, um, that are maybe um, like uh, uh, using chance operations or paying attention to what other people, other bodies in space, you know, how they are using landscape, how think, how people are moving or, or um, uh, out of necessity or out of, you know, ingenu in ingenu ingenuousness, ingenuity. Both. I'm not, it can both. be both. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, inventiveness, you know, and mm -hmm. trying to, to think in the same ways um, uh, and putting obstacles in front of, you know, those ways that I have been taught to see by, by cinema um, uh, and trying to, to generate other images that I hope will surprise me. I don't, um, I don't work so much with a, an image already in my mind, but rather I, I try to engage with processes that I hope will create other kinds of images. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I realize in setting up Godzilla, I didn't fully mention, but I think you, you know, there's you see that in the prism disruption in Ultras Usos, but mm -hmm. also when you screen Godzilla um, in a gallery setting, it's through a, a kind of broken piece of glass. Is that is it's still the, your it's, preferred installation? Right, it's through the same piece of glass that uh, my daughter appears mm -hmm. in the film, looking through it. Um, it, which is a, a piece of Fresnel lens um, from a, a lighthouse um, lens that mm -hmm. had already been breaking for a long time. <laughs> um, but, you know, its pieces were strewn around um, uh, Mount Nabo when after the hurricane. Yeah. That's interesting. It sort of distills this idea that there's both sort of the ongoing um, infrastructure failures that are not attended to and then the way the hurricane seems to be the cause of of everything but in fact is sort of manifesting things that are already right. happening yeah there's um, many many times where you would see something and you'd be like hurricane or before the hurricane. What's yeah. right um yeah and and that kind of ability to see different it is also alongside this ability to kind of mark time differently or experiencing time differently mm -hmm. and um, when we started kind of coming together as a trio that was something Kaina that you were kind of immediately drawn to the sense of time um, in Beatrice's work and I wanted to give you you know an invitation to kind of talk about that kind of what drew you to it, what you saw and you know if there are questions you have for Beatrice about how that functions for her. Absolutely well first of all it's lovely to be here tonight with both of you thank you so much for the invitation to um, and indeed, I'm fascinated by the temporality, sense of temporality in your work, Beatrice. And uh, it seems to be a very important strategy in your, as you were saying just now, you know, your reconceptualization of, of, of envisioning a place, and in particular, Puerto Rico, um, in, in Gosila, in Otros Usos, in La Cueva Negra, um, for which um, viewers uh, must have received a link. There are many evocations of the passing of time um, as we see it in Puerto Rico and in the Caribbean. And very often it's marked by different aspects of nature. You know, in Gosila, I think the, the, the horses copulating are a, a wonderful metaphor of that. It's like, you know, it's, it's an act of nature. It's, it's a function of nature and life goes on, right? after the hurricane, uh, the, 
the leaves that start to grow in the, um, in the trees after Maria, the paths being cleared, uh, the, the sounds of the night, of the evening, the coquillas, these little frogs we have. In otros usos, there's the motion of the water, the very act of fishing, which is so much about waiting. Mm -hmm. So um, it would be wonderful if you could speak about how you approach temporality and why is that kind of rhythm important to you? Yeah, I, um, I think that maybe you described it well already. <laughs> um, I think that I'm, I'm trying to pay attention, um, just recognizing that my own sense of time is objective, that I am ordered as well in that sense. And so um, one, one good way that I have to get out of my own sense of time is to pay attention to processes that are outside of me. Um, and so, for example, I didn't go looking for horses copulating, but um, I was just uh, happening to be uh, shooting the landscape um, uh, and, and, and they stood in front of me, you know, perfectly framed. So, you know, it's also, you know, a lot of it is responding, you know, recognizing an event and paying attention to it because it is asking to be uh, recognized in some way. That's the moment of encounter where maybe you know, some some interesting things can happen and and uh, my attention and their inattention to me is so evident um, that it becomes that becomes the idea on camera, you know, it becomes that um, uh, um, both their both both my or our looking um, at their copulating and also their, you know, uh, complete in attention to our look. Um, and that was something that I was, that is, is sort of repeated in other moments of, of the film, even though, you know, the film is made up of these, as I had mentioned before, bits and pieces that I had not thought of putting together, but that had come from a desire to, to document without um, documenting the, um, through a catastrophic image, you know, through an image, because, because the image of catastrophe is, is um, an image that is used just prior to creating an argument for wiping a slate clean, um, uh, displacing people, um, even, you know, in, in Puerto Rico's history, this um, uh, way of, of um, looking and creating images has been used as a, the moment before expropriation of huge tracts of land. Um, so, so that's something that I was interested in. It's, there's no way to undo it, but rather to, you know, to, to go around, well, how can you recognize this moment, but without falling into the trap of re reproducing an image of catastrophe that is an invitation um, uh, to, to, to see ourselves only as destroyed, only as, you know, uh, uh, people in need of saving or um yeah sorry i yeah. went from time to someplace else but... yeah no no it's interesting because i'm thinking through a couple of things that are sort of mm. in, in implicit in that and, and in the way you sort of use this strategy of going around and to the side because there's both you know there's how the image of catastrophe opens possibilities of wiping clean and control which is something i think taina you know kind of also was talking about in you know she's doing this research project on 1898 and and how imaging the colonial was so important and you know i hope that you'll talk more about you know kind of how you're seeing this in that context but then there's also the way in which imaging it as beauty as just sheer beauty also isn't sufficient right so or is distracting or maybe is you know undercuts the sense that to see is to know completely mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. and how much that operates in the images of Vieques mm -hmm. where you know there's as you've said before there's no way to see the toxic residue or the cancer rates you know that's not something mm -hmm. that the camera can show us and so how mm -hmm. do you get around that um mm -hmm. right yeah um, so, you know, you talked about the prisms as a strategy for mm -hmm. that. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, if you want to, I don't know how, how you kind of pick which strategy for which site might be really interesting to think about. Yeah, I was, I was, I had been, um, interested 
first in in looking at that site largest uh, uh, U.S. Navy base outside of the contiguous U.S. Um, so huge piece of land that uh, the United States had had used as a as a Navy base and the place from which um, uh, bombing uh, planes uh, took off and and bombed in the Vieques Sound and Vieques uh, themselves practiced bombing for sixty years, um, which practice bombs are real bombs, mm -hmm. um, and. Um, so I was interested in, you know, the, the, this, this base closed in 2003, um, and it had been more than 10 years um, since it had closed when I was filming. And so I was trying, very frustrated, you know, looking through my camera, um, looking at the ways in which the kind of monumental scale footprint uh, reproduced itself through a kind of rational use of the lens. Um, I was trying many different things. I produced three or four films and actually a sound piece in, in the process of these experiments. And this was, you know, I would, I would spend a long time there just like looking at the ways that people were breaking into the space, you know, like cutting the, the chain link fence and going inside and using it in, in many different ways. One of them was as, a place to fish from the shore. Um, and it was through the observation of people fishing that I understood that there was a way to transform the scale um, and that it was through um, small formal interventions. So in my case, I um, made these objects, these mirrored objects that I could hold in my hand in front of the camera lens. Um, I was shooting 16, so I, I didn't know exactly how it was going to come out. There's more, there's, I think you can even tell like sort of nervousness of the hand, you know, playing with it in relationship to the, pla the place. And it was a really a formal experiment to turn this, um, uh, this image that through the camera has so often been used, you know, as a, uh, this is my land, you know, as a way to demarcate uh, a territory that is owned, uh, as a way to describe the territory. So I wanted to transform it into something that could be held, um, that could be thought about in terms of um, a human scale. So, you know, it's a, it's a visual experiment to produce a different kind of image. The sound that you hear, I know somebody mentioned, is it silent? It's really low, but um, it is the natural echo that the warehouses on the shore uh, create as they mirror the sound that is produced on the coast. Mm. Um, so you can hear the conversations of people in the dock from very far away, and you know, um, so it's a it's a, a a kind of formal response to the shape of mm -hmm. that the shore takes. I think I have a question that is related to that, um, and perhaps perhaps the the answer has already been given. I don't know yet, uh, but maybe there's more to elaborate on. Uh, Beatrice, and, and uh, indeed it's the role of, of narrative in your films. I think um, you were just speaking about how you want to use the camera in a different way uh, than uh, to reproduce um, systems of seeing that are already in place, that are colonizing, uh, that are um, oppressive in some kind of way. Um, but there's also something very interesting to the, um, to the structure of the narrative in your work, which is nonlinear uh, very often, and um, where temporalities overlap. Um, and, and, and that is the case, for example, in La Cueva Negra, and I, perhaps you can speak a little bit about that. Um, I, you know, in a moment where so many people are describing themselves as storytellers, I, I notice it's very much a trend. 
in art mm -hmm. and in filmmaking to talk about yourself mm -hmm. as a storyteller. Mm -hmm. I feel your work does something quite different than traditional storytelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I sometimes you can read narrative into anything. So I guess it depends how one, how you know, wide or 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 narrow one defines it. But I guess I don't, you know, I think that there's a kind of um, there's there's a, a a danger to to structuring things in terms of of story. They they require um, us to think through individuals. They require a certain kind of identification with inferiority, um, character development, da, 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 da. and there's many things that that cannot be described in this way and are, are maybe flattened by it. I'm also, I guess if I was going to pick like a literary, literary form um, that I'm more interested in, it would be like Olympian literary experiments or um, poetic forms, um, because I think in a way, at least for me, I feel like there is a work that I need to do first that is about mm, moving things around and trying different ways of sense making that comes before um, uh, coming out, you know, like creating a whole um, new way of, of seeing. Um, so I, I'm more interested in this process of sort of breaking things apart. Like, how about like this? How about like this? How about like that? Um, and and um, and sometimes that means you know of course failed failing at, at some experiments you know <laughs> um, but whereas whereas story requires doesn't require I guess you could think about it differently but um, it seems to require to me a, a more um, traditional structure I've been working on a on a really different film for the past um, few years that is a um, a kind of is very very loosely based on Monique Wittig's Le Guerrier, which is a um, experimental uh, narrative novel, and um, so it's a novel. You could say that it tells a story, but not really. It has no protagonist. It's really about language. She's doing something else completely, and so I'm kind of interested in those in those experiments. Yeah, something you said just struck me, and it's like you know the way you do. You make me think entirely differently about something I think I've thought about a while, but, you know, what the category of experimental documentary implies is that a real documentary or normal documentary imposes a narrative that is completely not documentary and that we've gotten so used to that kind of controlling of the narrative mm -hmm. that when we actually are in a space where somebody just sits with what's happening or like just create space for the, mm -hmm. the space to unveil itself for the people to it, behave in ways that surprise and that then aren't sort of recast and reshaped to, to make us comfortable with them or to understand them as protagonists in an mm -hmm. arc, that that's what we've naturalized mm -hmm. and, and how much that kind of points to at what you've been talking about, this sort of colonialization of, of our imagination to the degree that we don't realize when that's happening and how it's operating and then what it does and makes unthinkable. So mm -hmm. when you, you know, and you kind of play with the term ethnographer, what, what that legacy of film means alongside an experimental one that's more in the poetics. And I think what you were just saying really got me to think about how interesting it is that you, that those are the words that we use to talk about what you do instead mm -hmm. of documentary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I should say that there's there's actually a really interesting essay um, written by a documentarian, Brett Story, mm -hmm. and also there's been a lot of work done by um, experimental um, documentary makers over the past few years on this kind of um, insistence on storytelling, you know, and what mm -hmm. it does, what it might leave out, what kind of... Um, assumptions it makes about you know identification like if that's if that's the only way that we can approach something is through saying this person is like me they're human just like me then um <laughs> what does that mean um yeah. maybe there's ways of being and thinking that are completely you know different and that you cannot identify with and and that doesn't um that doesn't um that, that shouldn't be a requirement um for understanding different 
forms of life and thinking yeah yeah um Tina, do you want to jump in? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I have I have um, a sort of a lingering biographical question, um, Beatrice, um, that really ties in also into well, per, partly into my uh, research for this exhibition that uh, Saisha mentioned that uh, I am co-curating with Kate LeMay, 1898 U.S. Imperial Visions and Revisions. Uh, with uh, curatorial assistant Carolina Maestre too. And this is a show that will happen next year at the National Portrait Gallery in April about the combination of UX expansionism um, in 1898 through the Spanish-American War, mm -hmm. the annexation of Hawaii, and um, a year later, the Philippine-American War. And two things that have been um, well, really, really fascinating to me uh, that I was already familiar with, but I've been able to dive deeper, of course, are the diasporas generated by 1898, the migrations and the sort of positionality that provides us as you know, migrant beings from both places in a way. Um, and of course, you know, as we've been talking, just the systems of visualizing the colonized and the other. Um, and I know you you were trained here in the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. in Chicago. I and just going back to that first first question that Saisha asked you about, how did you um, come to make work that really um, tries to dismantle that. Um, you know, that colonial gaze and that ethnographic gaze mm -hmm. in relation to Puerto Rico, you know, how did the experience of, you think, how do you think the experience of being trained on this side uh, in the U.S. informed that mm -hmm. um, and informs your, your, your positionality as a filmmaker? Yeah, well, I mean, that's interesting. When I think about it, I think, I mean, I don't think that the it's the it's the US training at the School of the Art Institute or University of Chicago that created the archive. I think it's like it's the archive that we have from the moment we start looking at images, photography. It's it's um, you know, it's one that comes from um all kinds of image making and circulation that I would have experienced, you know, in Puerto Rico as well, that I have experienced in Puerto Rico. And then, and it was actually in graduate school that I had, because I had some, some fabulous teachers who introduced me to the work of Sara Gomez in Cuba, who introduced me to um, Octavio Getino and Solana's work. I mean, I, I, I saw experimental Latin American film when I left Puerto Rico. So it was, um, that was actually uh, maybe a, an introduction to, to ways of thinking that I had not had the opportunity to, to think about. And, and then, and then when, I, when I went back home to Puerto Rico, I had this um, really more sensorial experience of understanding that certain things about modes of production and um, ways of making work simply did not apply. That applied in Chicago did not apply in Puerto Rico and that I needed to craft different ways of working that in a way were much more artisanal, that paid attention to things that happened around me there in Puerto Rico that did not happen you know, in Chicago. Um, and just, you know, uh, I, I started making like when I, when I went back home, um, I started making a lot of work that used um, techniques, theater techniques from um, Augusto Boal and a lot of like structured improvisation. And, and this is something that, you know, didn't come out of nowhere that came more from looking at the work that um, Puerto Rican theater makers um, who had, who were doing a lot of street theater and, you know, like what were their references and finding their kind of community of thinking that maybe could apply better to what I was, um, what I was trying to do. And so I kind of put those two things together, you know, um, be getting that film education that I was able to, to have access to um, in graduate school and then putting that together with 
other ways of thinking, making art and theater in Puerto Rico that I didn't get in um, through my education. Yeah. That's interesting. I guess I'd, I'd tie that then. I'm curious, um, once you're in San Juan and you're working with Beta La Cal, you also worked on these walking seminars. And mm -hmm. you know, were that was that maybe also in relationship to this kind of idea of improvisation and, and kind of an ebb and flow? And how does that kind of seminar in the space um, mm -hmm. and with other people go on to influence how you make films subsequently? Yeah, I mean, that came from really thinking about like, you know, once you start questioning some things, you start questioning a lot of other things as well. So <laughs> like, uh, wait, what am I doing teaching, you know, film sitting in a room with, with we're not moving from the chair. All we're doing is speaking, but I'm talking about how one needs to respond with sensorial attention. That doesn't make any sense. Like how, how, what kind of form could we come up with that would mm -hmm. um, generate that kind of sensorial attention without having to describe it? You know, mm -hmm. how could we all see it? Um, you know, so I, so that that was the way of generating. Um, okay, so maybe the class needs to be moving on foot, mm -hmm. and the first thing we would do, um, the first seminar was. First, we go to point A, then we go to point B, and we were moving in a car from point to point. And then after that first seminar, we realized, um, oh, we, we can't just go to point A and point B. We know how those two points are organized and what they are. Um, this is a base and this is, you know, for example. So we need to walk from what place to place and sort of um, that will generate the kind of sensorial attention to place a place that has no name, that has no mm -hmm. order that we can recognize. Um, and so, you know, it, it was a, a, a project that um, kind of transformed collectively through, through, through making and, um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, and that seems like something that you then do do a bit in your films, which is sort of let the, the subject or the space transform what it is you think you might do there or what it might mean when it, when it reaches the film. Right, yeah. I mean, I usually start with a kind of, you know, I call it like a structure in my pocket, you know, that I just <laughs> offer, you know, like here's a structure, you know, like let's play with mm -hmm. this because it's um, it's a kind of excuse, you know, to start mm -hmm. from. To start um, from somewhere. Yeah, yeah, people get very intimidated if you if you don't don't offer some place to start. I think that's very true. Yeah, and I I learned also pretty quickly that if you don't if you don't start from a place that changes things up, upside down to begin with, mm -hmm. then we tend to sit down and, and just talk or, you know, like then we tend to um, repeat the forms that we know. But so if you start, even if it's insane and it doesn't work, if you start with a thing that, you know, mm -hmm. that shakes things, then, okay, <laughs> we tried that, that didn't work, but there's a thousand other things that you could try. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a great seg to one of our audience questions. So we're going to, we're going to start to bring in some audience questions and um, we've got a couple, but feel free to put some more in. We've got a couple more minutes. Um, and one guest asks, you know, they, that there's a challenge to sometimes understanding maybe what you're trying to express, which is something I know you've talked about as sort of where expression um, falls in your practice, mm -hmm. but are there other kinds of approaches you might take for, for your work or different scenes, you know, in kind of, if there's, I don't know, messages to convey or something you do want to get across, um, if that's mm -hmm. not always happening. Yeah, um, I guess, um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I have, I mean, I do normally think of this not as something, not as expression, not as, as individual expression, but as experiments, you know, that, that are produced through an encounter. And sometimes there isn't anything really to understand about expression beyond that. It's just sort of to engage with an image or, um, but I, I, I guess I, I understand the question in the sense that like, uh, and I would say yes. I'm. I try many different things, um, and and um, and I understand that failure is part of the process of trying many different things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so another question is uh, about considering how the impacts of the U.S. military seem unreal to those who not do not experience it directly. 
um, as it is both kept secret and at a physical distance. And that's something that we were talking about as well. Can you speak to lens-based practice as perhaps contributing to visualizing this? And in this case, I'm not sure if it's visualizing the absence or when you visualize something that you don't see, do you kind of add to the sense that it's unreal or not there? Um, mm -hmm. And how do you see your work engaged in perhaps hyper-reality via video? Hmm. I'm not sure I know what hyper-reality is. I'm not sure either or, in this context. Yeah, but um, I, I think that, um, I think of my practice as contributing to creating languages that, or visual languages that, um, that can respond to or be an ana analogous or be recognizable as the ex you know the, as that experience um and so you know for example in the film that is made up of pieces you know of the months after the hurricane you those are images that may be hard to recognize for somebody that did not go through that process but for almost, you know, for anybody that was in Puerto Rico or, or, or has gone through a, a moment like that is, oh, why would they be chopping those trees with, you know, by hand with a machete, you know, what yeah. it, how did, you know, you, you're sort of, um, you kind of understand the moment and the pace mm -hmm. of the moment. Um, and so that's, I think that, that, that for me, it is um, not just important to, uh, have a visual language that describes to others, but that describes to ourselves, that is recognizable mm. to ourselves as well. And that's the language. There's so much media that is made about Puerto Rico that we're not the, it's not for us, you know? Um, it's not, it, it, is re, it represents our experience as others to others. But what I think, you know, film can really do is allow us to think in different ways. And so I'm, I'm interested in, in that and in making and in, in engaging with that mm. that problem yeah yeah that's so interesting Tain, do you want to add to that it felt like you were really feeling I that represents our experience as others to others say no yeah. more that's mm -hmm. like wow. um there's a question in the in the q a that it has a long introduction and and it's about an exhibition at um depaul university but i'm gonna i'm gonna go to the question and then um other people i think can read the intro because it relates to what you were just saying but that it was you know sort of presented with minimal captioning and seen as an opportunity to experience the messages of the piece and the issues and the concerns through the artist's eyes do you think seeing through the artist's eyes is your point or seeing through the subjects um, the other eyes in dissimilar spaces, such as campuses, corporate or council commissions to which our people come from, and that place, and then places that have no name or official address to mark its place, like Chea's Bodega or Mom's Kitchen with the smell, um, smell of food. Um, I think the hot comb, I don't know what that is. But um, I think that's a way of saying some of this question is sort of who is it for and who, mm -hmm. who who is um, expressing and who is being subject. But I think there's something in there that's even more pointed about what you were talking about. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the, there's a, I mean, I'm really interested in, there was a moment where I started thinking like, well, if you were going to tell a history of photography in the Caribbean, how would one tell it? Um, like you'd have to, think about it from the point of view of the subject you'd have to tell a history of photography from the subject's point of view as a person mm -hmm. as a as a as a, a person making meaning through the pose through saying no not you know go with your camera someplace else mm -hmm. um all of those are are um part of the history of of photography so i'm, I'm definitely interested in that in in the, the subject, I don't know that I can occupy the subject's point of view, but rather I'm interested in, in that possibility of encounter and sort of like, you know, what happens, mm -hmm. you know, when you, when you see, you know, the, the, the offer of the camera, which is like, I think of it <laughs> as like taking your eyes out really big mm -hmm. and going, here are my eyes, you know, what do we do with this? 
Um, like, where do you, you know, how do you want to direct my eyes? What does it mean for me to, to look with you, next to you? Mm -hmm. What kinds of things can I see that I couldn't see otherwise? Um, yeah. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I realized I, I missed a key part of the question. So this was an mm -hmm. exhibition about the Young Lords, which um, was an important mm -hmm. activist group in, in New York. And and then I think the, the questioner felt like it was about the artist's take on mm -hmm. them rather than the subject. So that's important. And mm -hmm. also in there was the question of sort of how your work is exhibited or does it make the rounds at universities and colleges, which I think it does. Do you, do you prioritize that or do you find that a good space for, mm -hmm. for having these kind of conversations alongside and with the work yeah um i guess you know i don't know my work circulates mostly in spaces like museum institutions gallery spaces i have a, i mean a, of course there's always like a community of of um artists and filmmakers that show the work in universities and things like that just like we show each other's work yeah um and and I think where it's it's um harder is um I don't know about harder. I mean I guess you know for me that that though that that circulation you know in museum spaces is the 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 institutional you know moment mm -hmm. um, in which you have to sort of deal with ways of looking that are you know, particular you know that come from particular histories of display and exhibition. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was thinking, I think you recently had a solo show at the Broad Museum at, uh, is that Michigan University? And mm -hmm. so that's also an interesting space very often, these like very beautifully polished architectural gallery mm -hmm. spaces that do have a community for thinking around it. Um, seems yeah. like it would be a good um, fit. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask, Taina, do you have other questions that you wanted to bring to the fore? Um, well, only a comment that, that um, thinking about your work in institutional spaces um, that are uh, not exactly contemporary art spaces, but more, let's say, historical museums, you know? Um, or uh, museums where, where art and history intersect, um, it must, I would imagine it was really provide a very striking contrast mm -hmm. to, to, the, to the ways of seeing that are um, embodied in the collections and in the exhibitions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah I've mean, been I, thinking about that too, just that to mm -hmm. add Sam, we have this landscape collection. And so to think about your work in relation to um, both the histories of photography and surveillance, but painted landscape that also has its own legacies of domination and erasure. So it's really, it is exciting for me to think alongside you of other ways of seeing that, that when you walk into a space and not kind of have mm. to organize it in that way. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, so I think we're perfectly at time for um, this wonderful conversation and it's been a real joy um, to be in conversation and to think um, about these works. And yes, I wanna encourage people, um, we didn't get to talk about it quite as much as um, we might've liked, but La Cueva Nerga, The Black Cave is um, a longer piece by Beatrice that she's willing to share with us um, that you can all have, you have password links um, access to, to watch until March 31st. And um, you have two works in an upcoming film festival. Is that right? Uh, one, I think or one. one? At Maybe. Okay. The, if anybody's in New York at Art of the Real in Lincoln Center. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, well, rush out there and go see that. Um, and then know that we'll be back here next Wednesday for our next film screening on March 23rd, again at 5.30 um, p.m. Eastern time with the incredible Sharon Nashat. So um, please register for that one as well and join us. And thank you all. And thank you all who joined us um, out there in cyberspace. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming. Bye.